So we are back live with everybody. Glenn and Amber Schwarm here for What's Your Flippin' Problem? All right, welcome aboard. Uh, we got a new new format. Got to make sure I can see who's joining us here. Can I see who's joining us, babe? Oh, there's David. Hi, David. David King. How are we doing, David? What's your flipping problem today? <laughs> Gotta like that, huh? All right. So, guys, we are here every Thursday at five o'clock. Uh, I want to see who's joining us. I yeah, can't let me find see that. If I can see that. Sorry, guys. We're trying to work on something here. Amber's do working her magic. Nothing's ever simple in the technology world. It seems simple on the onset, but not so much. So let's see what we got there. Hold all right. On, let's see. Oh, wait. Did we lose the screen? No, it just minimized. All right. Hold on. Stand by, guys. We're working on a couple things here. I see some folks joining us. So we're here for What's Your Flipping Problem? Amber and I are here to answer any of your flipping questions today. Uh, anything about uh, flipping, the journey, the life, all that kind of stuff. So again, every Thursday at 5 o'clock Eastern Time, we're here to help you and answer any of your questions. So... We have some questions that people have already sent in. We can start with those, and uh, we'll go from there. I can't see who's on here. I want to say hi to everybody, I but I can't find it, so we're trying to look for that. So so say hi in the comments, guys, because normally we yeah. can see as you're coming up, but it's not showing us. We're in Google Chrome this time, so we could do it from our computer instead of our phone. So yeah. um, just put a comment over there in the comments, and just, just say hi. Just say hi. We won't bite, I promise. I see a bunch of you on here. I just don't know uh, who you are, so I want to see what that is. So All right. So let's tell you what, let's let's start. So again, we're here, Glenn and Amber Schwarm are here for uh, What's Your Flippin' Problem? And we're here to answer any questions you have. Hey, Jim. How you doing, brother? There's a local, I know that. Hi, Zedra. Zedra. Z oh, Zedra, I'm sorry. Zedra, Zedra. Well, I'm not, be, good, with, I'm not good with pronunciation, so I'm sorry if that's uh, that's not right. So yeah, say hi in the chat box, guys. Again, we, don't, we, we can't see who's coming in for some reason. Amber's working on that. But let me jump through a couple of questions kind of as we get started. We'll kind of get warmed up. And if you guys have questions, by all means, hey, Helen. If you have any questions, by all means, please put them in the chat box, and we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. So we had a question that came in uh, this week on one of the posts. It's Sally asked, what's the difference between points and interest? Points and interest. It's a good question. Yeah. It's so funny. When you do something for a while, you forget what's new, what was new to you at one time. And I think Amber and I have fallen into that. Uh, fall, we, we say things, and people are like, what does that mean? We're like, what do you mean? You know what that means? Well, here we are. So points and interest. The difference between points and interest is pretty simple. Interest is what you pay on a monthly basis for, or a daily basis actually, for borrowing money, right? That's what you pay for borrowing money. So if you were to pay um, on a typical investor loan, it might be 10% interest. Here's how this works. 10% interest is divided. It's a short term. It's called simple financing, so it's not, um, not necessarily amortized. You're paying simple financing when you're doing... Um, investor financing now if you're refinancing a loan all right hey mike hey i gotta call you mrs gogan sorry i can't say nancy i know who you are so i can't say nancy it doesn't feel right i've known you for well 50 40 years now so good welcome and sharice sharice welcome so interest if you take if you borrow a loan it's about 10 percent. so 10 percent on a loan uh is broken down like this you're let's say you borrowed a hundred thousand dollars at 10 percent 10% of that is $10,000, right? 10% 10 of 100,000 is $10,000. You would divide that 10,000 by 365 days, unless you're in a leap year, it's 366, which I believe we were this year, um, unless it's COVID. Isn't it less if it's a leap year? Well, no, they divide by 366. There's an extra day on leap year. Leap, right? There's an extra day. Oh, I was thinking there was a little day less. She was homeschooled. It only, it only happens every four years, so I she, forgot. She was homeschooled. So that's just, oh. <laughs> Explain okay, that. Okay, mister, I don't know how to read a tape measure. <laughs> so anyways, okay, so I shouldn't pick on her too much. All right, plus I just, I'm going to pay for that later. Um, so divide that, divide that $10,000 by the amount of <clears throat> days in the year, and that'll give you a daily rate. You'll pay interest for every day that you borrow that money. So if you borrow the money for six months or six months and three days, that's how the interest is calculated. So that's, that's what interest is, right? You pay money on the interest for the time you borrow the money points is one percent okay that's an upfront fee that you pay a lender now sometimes if you're buying with a bank uh they might call it a origination fee or they might call it a i don't know fee they have all kinds of names for their fees but they still get paid for this too so a point is simply one percent of a loan so if somebody says to you in the investor world a loan is going to cost you three points and ten percent that means you're going to pay three thousand dollars on because it's three points is three percent, right? Or three thousand dollars on a one hundred thousand dollar loan, and then you'll pay the regular ten percent interest at the time that you borrow it. So, 
Hope that question made sense. A long way to get there and some insulting going in the between there, but that's uh, the way it is. So, Saul, how are you? Hope I'm saying that right, Saul. And William, uh, William and uh, Zedra. Okay. All right, Zedra said, I want to begin investing, but I don't know how to find the funds besides personal loans. My husband wants to use creative financing, but I don't know. We're stuck right now. Got it. Um, so, at our home flipping workshop, which we just had last weekend, we go over that in detail. So I don't have enough time to answer all the, all the ways to do it on here, but I will tell you, creative financing is certainly one of them, right? Private money is another one. We rate all of our stuff done through private money. Yep. You can do something called owner financing. So not just creative, but owner financing where the seller holds the note for you. So let me give you an example of that, Zedra, and see if this makes sense to you. Okay. Um, you find somebody who wants to sell a house. That's the first step is to find someone who wants to sell a house, right? And you don't have the money to buy it. Oh, good. She's coming to the workshop in January. Oh, well, you'll you're, learn. You're going to learn all about this. And there's so many really great ways. Um, there's, I, I interrupted you. You were kind of in the middle of a thought I process. was, but hey, whatever. You know, just cut me off. I guess it's no good. All right. So here we <laughs> go. Um, you find a house. The owner says, I'm willing to sell the house, but I want to sell it for $110,000. let us say you run all your numbers and you say, gosh, I can only pay $100,000 with cash. So you say to them, listen, I'll give you the one ten that you want, but I'll give it to you when I sell the house in about six to eight months. So it's almost a 0%, and we've done this many times and it works really well. So I'll give you the amount you want for the house, but you'll get it as soon as I'm done with the house. You can do an owner finance, there's some paperwork to do there, you can do owner finance. They will allow you to come in, and then you have to find the money to do the renovations. Now that can be credit cards, a lot of times it is credit cards, or it could be somebody that loans you Thirty, forty thousand dollars to do it. It could be, uh, uh, you know, a home equity line of credit. It could be. It's always going to be somebody else's money, right? If it's credit cards, that's somebody else's money. If it's um, uh, a partner or a friend, you can have five friends loan you ten grand on their credit cards. You can get very clever with how you get the money for the renovation. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you can even talk to the contractor and have him, you know, go in kind of as a partner with you. And um, he gets paid when the house sells. So there's there's all different ways to kind of find creative solutions to the to the deal. What is really cool is, you know, it's it's fear and lack of knowledge that holds people back from getting started in this business. And when you start to learn the ins and outs and the different methods and and kind of tricks of the trade that um, we're gonna show, we're gonna teach at the home flipping workshop. It takes that fear away, and then you can like really move forward in a positive direction with confidence. And that is when it gets really fun. Totally. So uh, let me see here. Mike. Mike said, I just saw one from Mike. I lost it right below there. What's your opinion on investing in real estate outside of the state you live in? Good question. Let me take a look. You sure. want to be? Go ahead. So outside the state you invest in, certainly, you know, when we live in New York State, um, I have my own feelings about how things are going here, but. <laughs> Um, you know, the high, taxes are really high, but at least it's freezing cold. Okay, so it's it's an interesting, it's interesting place to live it's in. It's a win-win. Yeah, so we, we're just ocean people, guys. We like the warmth. But when you want to invest out of state, I think it's important that you have some eyes and some boots on the ground, right? You can do it, but you want to have a good team on the ground. Because um, when you invest out of state, you're going to have to get there and take a look at that property. You can use technology to your favor, and I would recommend that you do that uh, as often as possible. Um, if you're going to invest, uh, you know, if you're brand new, I'd be really cautious if you're brand new on doing that, uh, right away. Like for your first deal, if it's going to be a flip eh, rental, you can definitely, that's easier to do because you're going to make, you're going to make the rental journey a couple times and have somebody do the work for you. And then after that, you'll turn into a property management company if you do it the way that we teach. And, uh, then you can sort of be hands off from that investment. So that's, that's one way to do it. So you can do it outside of your current state. Um, but again, just... One of the things that we teach is we say, listen, for your first deal, try not to do it too far away from where you live because when you, if you don't get there often, contractors cannot show up and they can, you know, they can be doing, and not even that, they can be, they can be doing the work and really busting their ass doing the right work, but they don't do the right work. They're, they're, they're painting the wrong color on the wrong wall or they're, or they're putting the wrong kitchen cabinets in, which has happened, right? Or the mm -hmm. wrong way. Or and, they ripped out cabinets that I didn't want them to rip out. Just happened just happen and if we so don't go there every day right so yeah so if you don't go there every day you can't you don't get to see now you could we could have fixed that problem if we've been there every day what, what, were, you, what were you doing you rookie amateur hour on that one but that, that's a little bit of a loaded question too because it depends on what um, type of real estate investing you want to do if you're flipping that can definitely present more challenging if you're flipping out of state and it's it's a 
harder to manage. However, if you're buying like turnkey properties to go into your rental portfolio, that can easily be done out of state. So, it can. So I, I think it depends on your exit strategy as well. Uh, there was one long one I, I saw. I know, here. and it's there gone. Was a long one. I, that's it's what gone I was now. scrolling there, to there see. There was a long question. There was here. somebody that said, I think it was basically there aren't any houses in my area. If you had that question, I, I felt like somebody wrote that question and now I don't see it. I don't there was see a long. It. I don't think you can delete your question once you're writing here, guys. Yeah, can you? you probably can. Maybe you can. All right. Well, if that, if you want that question answered, please put it back. We just lost it in the. Do in what you do. What you are, you people saying to me? I'm not sure what that means. Do it. Okay. Do what are, are you people, people saying, saying to me? me? I'm not. I'm not sure what that. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I don't want to show that. Okay. If what should we say? Well, Saul so, oh, so okay. said, if you have a, if I have a real estate license, and I can still do flipping. Are you at? So what I think you're asking is, do I? Do I need a real estate license to do flipping? Is that the question that you're asking, Saw? Do you have to have a real estate license to do flipping, if that's what you're asking? I'm going to go with that. If that's the case, no, not at all. I am not an agent. I've never been one, never played one on TV, right? I'm not a real estate agent. Amber is a broker only because we do so many deals that just made sense. Yeah, we, I wasn't in the beginning. You do no. not have to have a real estate license to be a real estate investor. In, in some cases, it's advantageous, and in some cases, it can actually make things a little more complicated because you have to, um, you have to, uh, announce is not the right word, but you have to disclose that you're a real estate agent when you're buying the house and some, you know, to some sellers that might be a turnoff, but. Yeah, maybe. But, but no, you do not have to have a real estate license to be a successful real estate investor. Yeah. Now, does it help? Yeah, what it helps is getting information. Like it used to be, we became an agent to get information. I had a lot of good friends that were brokers and agents that helped me, but um, that's what we did initially. But now, now there's so much information uh, so online much, so with Zillow, Realtor.com, yeah. and different software programs that it, it really is an unnecessary thing. And if you if you have an agent that you're working with to help you find investment properties on the MLS, you know they're going to be a good resource for you too. So, yeah. you know, it, it, there might come a time in your business if you're if you're growing a bigger business <clears> where it makes sense to be become an agent um, so you can list your own properties but if you're just doing you know a handful of year that's that's not really going to be an issue at all so let me just so guys just just for the guys who are jumping on here uh, the folks are jumping on so you are with the uh, Glenn and Amber Schwarm and uh, we run the home family workshop we're real estate investors and all stuff and the show is what's your flipping problem and it's all about real estate investing any questions you have for us and we would love to hear your questions. I've got some offline questions that people have sent to us <clears> throughout the week. So I'm going to jump back because I want to get to Sharice's uh, question here in just a minute. But um, in the meantime, if you have any questions about real estate, please put them in the, in the chat box, whatever they might be. And no question is a dumb question, right? We're not going to make fun of you for any question. We know you're brand new trying to figure things out. So please put it in the chat box and we'll be more than happy to uh, to answer those yeah, questions. Yeah, and so if you're already in the process of getting your license, go ahead, go for oh, it, yeah. get it. We're not gonna tell you it's not never, to. It's never a bad thing. Yeah. It gives you access to deals and if you want to, you can put, like if you bought things that were, you could actually put some of that commission back in your pocket, right? So that's a, a way you can do it too. But I wouldn't discourage anyone that doesn't have a license to not get into real estate because it's perfectly fine either way. Most real estate investors are not agents. Right. That's what I found, most are not agents. Okay, um, all right. Jennifer asks, is HGTV math like like real numbers? Ha, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you know, remember guys, those are reality shows. So those shows are designed to entertain. Um, you know, nothing used to piss me off worse than I'd sit on the couch and go, oh, he's struggling, struggling. Oh, I, I sold it, made 104,000. I go, shut up. And she used to go, Will you stop? It's just a show. Will you stop watching the TV? It's early in our career. I'm like, oh, give me a break, $100,000. Now, what they seem to never disclose in those shows is holding costs. What's a holding cost? Holding cost is the cost for you owning a home. So the interest on your loan, the taxes you pay, utilities, maintenance costs, all those are costs you have for owning a home, just like your own home. They never seem to disclose those numbers, do they? And so it drives me crazy because those numbers are big. Commissions are big when you buy a house. Closing costs when you buy and sell a house. They never seem to disclose those. On our ads that we run for the home flea workshop, that's the common thing we get. Oh, you didn't talk about closing costs. And I, I have to answer every one of them and say, it's in there. If you look closely, it says, I think our ad says, um, buying and closing costs included. So we wrap them in there. Because I told people, I said, you know, for an ad, I'm not going to line item every every line and confuse people. The graphic would be so confusing. Yeah. It's so, confusing. yeah, we, we chunk those in there. Yeah. So Sharice is asking, looking at a rental property in the basement has all <clears> sorts <throat> of cracks in the wall. Then I noticed beams up against the wall holding them up. Would you run or have someone check it out first? 
Um, so it certainly doesn't sound good if there's cracks and there's things holding, but the beams might have been the solution. So yeah, I would definitely have somebody go check it out. You know, any, any brand new um, investor, we're always going to encourage you to have a home inspector go with you to look at the house so that you don't get in too deep into something that's gonna that you're gonna lose money on. Could I could I answer that question a little differently? Is that okay? No, no, it's a good answer. <laughs> Here's my answer. Anything can be fixed with money. We bought houses. Remember the house out in Selkirk one time, wherever that was, and we had to we had to replace all four walls in the basement. Yep. No, but the, maybe but, yeah, all four. But the numbers still worked. Right. So anything can be fixed with money. So Sharice, when you run your numbers. Just be prepared, like on something like that, where you see four bad walls or even one bad wall. A bad wall is five or ten thousand dollars usually to replace. If you're gonna have to, if it's a basement wall that you have to take out, and they can, they can take it out during the winter. They can do all that. That's, this, anything can be done with money. Anything. The question is, is the money you invest worth it? So we teach our students: if you invest one dollar, can you get a dollar fifty back? Right. That's what it boils down to. So. Foundation problems can be very good to buy a house because they're scary to most people. To me, it's just a number. It's just a number. Now, again, if I if I run the numbers and say, well, it's going to cost me twenty thousand dollars to fix this foundation, and the profit margin is not there, and the seller's not willing or able to budge, then there's no deal. But if I can buy it right and do that, put that work in, that's then you can do it. But like Amber said, have an inspector there to help you get through that and navigate that world. But remember this. Anything can be fixed with money. It just depends if the money that you're investing makes sense so you make a profit at the end. If it doesn't make sense, then don't do it. But anything can be fixed with money. So great question from David. How do you guys not get frustrated or deal with the frustration on problems or lack of the momentum you might be wanting to see happen? I don't know. I've never been frustrated in my life. Next question. <laughs> So <laughs> Just kidding, I, David. I definitely remember this in the early days. Um, we we may have lost out on a deal. We got outbid on it by another investor, or we had a house that um, we really wanted to buy and timing wasn't right or whatever. And I can relate to this question even now because, um, you know, when, when our oldest daughter graduates, which is in two and a half years, two and yep. a half years, yep. we want to move to Florida. But we're already looking at houses. Like, I'm on lists, and I see all of the new houses that come up in the area of Florida we want. And... Um, you know, sometimes like one of the ones I have saved, well, I'll get a notification that it's sold. And like, you know, part of me gets a little disappointed, but you know, it's just that timing is not right. So here's the, the, um, coping statement that I use is there's always going to be another one. And you know, whether that's, it was in the beginning when we got outbid by other investors yep. or whatever, I just know that there's always going to be other ones that are going to come along. I just heard, uh, Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, um, not that I'm wearing them or anything, I'm just saying. <laughs> Um, so, anyway. you tell me, honey? <laughs> so the founder of Spanx, I heard her interviewed and she actually <laughs> said um, that her dad told her kid, her and her sister or sisters, or whatever it was growing up, um, how often, you know, what did you fail at this week? I said, what a great question to ask your kids. It sounds so opposite from what we've always heard, but what, what did you fail at this week? Because you know that if you're not failing, you're not succeeding. If you're not failing, you're not succeeding. So David, when you are getting frustrated, if you're frustrated, you should also be failing, right? If you're frustrated because nothing's happening, then ask yourself, are you taking action? If you're not taking action, probably you're not failing, and that feels frustrated. So you're either frustrated or pissed or really happy, right? So if you're frustrated, maybe you're not taking enough action. I suggest that you take as much action as you possibly can while keeping your family life balanced. Take as much action as you can in your business, and then um, you'll fail. And the more you fail, the more you fail, the more you will succeed. It's as simple as that. Failing so forward. You have to fail. That's the number one thing to be successful is you have to fail and fail often. And whether you have a coach like us, whether you don't, whether someone's holding your hand or not, you're going to fail. It's part of the game, and you've got to deal with that frustration. So say to yourself, if, if I'm frustrated, am I doing the work? Am I, am I pushing forward, right? Um, if you're if you're frustrated, maybe you're not doing enough work. I'm not saying you in general, but anybody. Maybe you're not doing enough work. And the more that you fail, you'll eventually succeed. And then your frustration will go from I'm frustrated to I'm pissed. You should almost be pissed, right? You should almost be failing enough where you're like, God, this sucks. Man, I can't get a lead. I'm looking at houses. I can't find it. I put phone calls out. No one's calling me back. That's how this goes. But you have to keep failing and keep failing and keep failing because eventually the phone will ring. 
and it's the right deal at the right time and they called you when you're the first one they called you go out there you make an offer and it becomes your deal but you have to stay hot on on the task though because you know mm -hmm. maybe maybe the house that you lost the bid on last time against another investor they're tied up in that house now so they're not going to be bidding on the next one right you know and and that cycle you know real estate is very cyclical and that cycle of it of investors and where they're at in their business and competition and everything you have to keep going keep going keep going until you find that deal so, David, I hope that helps your question with frustration. So, my, my, my answer to how do I avoid frustration is to fail more. What a weird answer, right? But if you fail more, I'm telling you, you will succeed. And the very first real estate course I bought, I, I talk about this often, the only thing I really remember from it was opening up and it said, action equals success. But massive action equals massive success. So, if you want to get to your goals faster, fail faster. And tell your brain that... that it will happen as long as you're taking action. Yep, and never give up on it. So hope that helps. Uh, Sharice, you're very welcome. Uh, Zedra. Zedra. All right, is it Zedra or Zedra? Well, let's, I'm going to go with Zedra. Um, do you recommend cold calling? I hate it, and people can be so rude. I as well hate it. Um, I don't like cold calling. I'm, there are people that do it. Um, and for those of you guys who don't know, cold calling is when you call you know, leads or lists of names, <clears throat> and you're calling those people to see if they want to sell a house. Doesn't seem like a very productive use of time. Not really. No. So, yeah, go ahead. I think probably what I would suggest is, you know, if you're, I would probably suggest the driving for dollars where you're driving around a neighborhood and trying to find houses that look vacant and um, your time is probably better spent leaving a nice little note on that door and <clears throat> better yet, even going to knock on the neighbor's doors and talk to them and right. see if they have some connection to the owner or know who it is. So at least the calls you're making are... Um, you know, you Productive. Least, yeah. Yeah. You want to spend your time as a real estate investor, and it's Zedra. It was Z. You were Jeez, right. I, no, I said Zedra, I think, but Zedra. No, I, yeah. All right, good. You were right. What a shocker. No, you were right. You said Zedra oh, first. All right. Actually. So you want to, I was busy, I was busy hearing I was right. I sort of spaced out there for a minute. I don't know what you said. Those words taste like vinegar. Yes, I'm sure they do for you. So, um... Uh, you want to use your time. So you, as a real estate investor, you want to do the highest the high, you want to do the most value for your time, right? So you want to say, you want to do the things that produce the biggest um, bang for your buck, so to speak, right? Things that can be subbed out to somebody else is what you should do. So if you want to do cold call, you can hire VAs. A VA stands for virtual assistant. Sometimes they're in the Philippines, or they can be some people here, but they're usually they're a lot less expensive in the Philippines, and, and they're thrilled to have the work. And we have people that do some cold calling for us, right? We do that. I, I would never want to do that work myself. As the investor, I want to go out and find better ways to find better leads and be looking for leads, right? Be searching leads. Because cold calling is a um, tough job. If you're not wired for it, if your personality is not wired for it, you will get burned out in two seconds. That's not the way that, you know, that's not the way you want to fail, right? That's that's a hard way of failing because you're going to get beat up on the phone, like you said, because people are rude. And most people would be rude. If you call me and say, you want to buy my house? I'm like, I was in the middle of having dinner. Shut up. Right? You know, you don't want to have that conversation then. So I, I would do that. So just make sure that you're using your time at the at the highest value that you can use it for you because that's what you want to do. So, uh, so you said driving for dollars is way more productive. Yes, driving for dollars is way more productive, but it's hard trying to find the owners. Seem the most impossible. Not impossible. I always take solace in the fact that if something is hard to do, most people drop off and don't do it. Right? So if I find something hard, I say, oh, this is good. This is hard, so I'm failing. Right, David? So I'm. this is hard. I'm failing. I'm going to keep failing. Because I know that most people get to that first roadblock and never keep going. Right? They get frustrated and they quit. Right. And so when they do that, they miss out on the opportunity. The opportunity is that you're driving for dollars. You can't find the owner. You're trying. You're trying. But if you don't stop, you'll find them. Sometimes it takes 5, 10, 15, 17, 18 phone calls to find the owner. That's a better use of your time and than cold calling randomly to try and get one out of 500. And right? you probably don't have a lot of competition for driving for dollars. And you don't have to like, you know, take hours and hours and hours and hours. I mean, just take a different way home from work. Just, you know, take a different direction to the grocery store. You, you don't have to necessarily spend days and weeks, you know, just ask everybody that you know to let you know. You can put a post on Facebook and say, hey, if any of you, if any of my friends in my on my friend list have any houses on their street that look vacant, you know, send me the address and I'll send you a referral fee. Yep. 
A lot of ways you can do it to get the, to get the deal done. So, guys, if you're just joining us, if you're here, uh, Glenn and Amber Schwarm, we're here for uh, What's Your Flippin' Problem? And we'll do this every single Thursday at 5 o'clock, unless it falls on a holiday or Christmas Eve, which I think is coming up. Um, so, uh, other than that, we'll be here answering any of your questions live for free uh, on flipping, on building your rental portfolio, on wholesaling, on airbnb on how to manage a relationship through this, on how to, you know, deal with four kids and... Going to meet my granddaughter coming up this uh, very soon. Can you believe that? Going to meet my 12-week-old granddaughter coming up. That's exciting. That's pretty cool. Yes, that'll be on Sunday. We've got about five more minutes, guys, so hit us. Five more minutes. If you have questions, please fire away. want to remind you that we do. You can go to homeflippingworkshop.com. A little self-promotion. But you can go to homeflippingworkshop.com. Spend three days with us, and we really dive into all these details in great uh, detail. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> Even all these in questions depth. in great detail. In depth, yeah. In depth. And, uh, and answer any questions that you have there. So, Linda, Linda said, should we stay away from vacant homes owned by corporate? Um, that's a great question, Linda. I would tell you don't stay away from them, but watch them. From our experience, and I am a resourceful son of a gun. I mean, if there's a way to find the owner to talk to, I will find it. I've spent years trying to find owners of these corporate things and finding someone at the bank that will approve that sale. What I have found, even after talking to presidents of banks who were friends of friends, so I had an in, I had a connection, even they couldn't do it. Right? Yeah, Grandpa Schwarm. Thank you, Mike. So, wow, that sounds weird. So, I did get glasses last week. So, <laughs> um, But even the, even the president of the bank couldn't authorize that sale because they have a process. And their process is they sit on those houses till they are god darn good and ready to sell the house. It's the most frustrating thing in the world when you're trying to buy a house. Because you, you as an investor, tell me, tell me you guys. I wish I could see your hands. You could give me a show of hands. But tell me this. Doesn't it make sense to you as an investor, if you're sitting on a house, it, they should sell that house, right? The bank should sell that house. It's just sitting there. They're paying taxes. Have you seen houses in your neighborhood? We, we drive by one pretty often on uh, over on Gordon Road there. Ten years, mm -hmm. at least. Ten years been vacant for. Probably more like 13, 14 years been vacant. It's all run over, whatever. I'm like, man, why won't the bank sell that house? They've had to have paid at least $50,000 in taxes because the bank still has to pay taxes. Right, and they paid all that maintenance cost to keep it so that you know. I'm sure there's been problems in the house, all that kind of crap. I'm sure that's all happened, right? And all I all I can say is, why would you? You can't try and understand why a bank thinks the way they think. If you do, you will want to blow your brains out. It's not. It doesn't make any sense to an investor. None. But a bank is not an investor. A bank is a financial institution, and they have their own reasons why they do what they do. A good friend of mine, Jeff Miller, is a uh, VP at Sunmark around here. And um, that's, a, that's a local credit union. Sorry, local credit union. Yeah, yeah, some market. <laughs> a local place that sells sun glasses. <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, it's a large credit union here. And I asked him with them. I said, "Look, dude, talk to me. Do you have any idea?" And he said, "It was frustrating me too." So I've talked to a lot of people. The best they can figure out is that the big banks, it might make more sense for them to keep that house on their balance sheet and take a loss from a tax perspective than to sell the house and get it off their books. So they have an ulterior motive that you and I will never understand because we're real estate investors and it will drive you bonkers. So don't try and do it. And the best thing you can do is to wait for that house to come on the market. The The best thing you can do is to net ready. This is some gold I'm going to give you right now. For those of you guys who are listening, this is gold. Start finding out who the REO agents are in your area. An REO agent stands for real estate owned. That means that a bank owns real estate they, and they have agents that work for them that really exclusively list their properties. They usually have two or three agents that work with them to sell their properties. Get in close with them and ask them this question. At, Mr. Hughes, what's going on, brother? <laughs> ask them this question, right? Ask them this question. Say, so listen, do me a favor. Would you mind, before it hits the open market, just let me know. And they can probably let you know the night before, right? So as soon as they get the listing, they might give you a call and say, hey, listen, go check out that house. If you want to put an offer in, get it in quick, and Monday morning I'll take it. Because some banks, some banks will not accept offers for the first three or four days because they want to drive the price up. Some banks will take the first offer because they don't want to mess around with it. And those are the people you want to give us. The goal I just gave you was powerful. Right, so hopefully you enjoy hanging out with us here for for thirty minutes. But you kind of need to have your finance. You need you need to have kind of your business set up at that point, though, when you're making those kind of offers. Though you want to have your finance nah. and you know. God, are you new here? We didn't have that when we first started. 
Well, you want to have some of your finances in place, but listen, I'm I'm more I'm much more of a uh, ready fire aim kind of a person. So. Well, okay, so you don't want to make an offer on that kind of house and and screw up a relationship that you want to start with an REO agent if Fair you're enough. not going to follow through. Fair enough. Because those are those are really important relationships to have. Very true. And, and there's there's a little more sequence to it than that. You're right. That didn't taste good. <laughs> Okay, anyway, so, all right. Well, guys, listen, I appreciate you guys being here today. Any more final questions? Again, you're with Glenn and Amber Schwarm, and we are with What's Your Flippin' Problem every Thursday at 5 o'clock. So I want to tell you, we have an announcement coming up, right? We do. We have a new show. We actually have two coming out, but one you're going to start seeing next Thursday. I think it airs at 6 o'clock here on Facebook, and it's a journey with the Schwarms, right? And it's all about our journey, kind of the back the back life of us. It's an edited show. It's coming um, out on Christmas Eve. Isn't that's that not. That's not next Thursday. That's not next Thursday. Again, home, next Thursday? guys. Oh, home, today's the tenth. Okay. Homeschooled. Two She's weeks. very confused in that okay. stuff. So, anyways. No, so. just living with you, my head is like this all the time. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> she means that in a good way. Clearly, that's what she means. So next Thursday at six o'clock, that'll be coming out, and uh, you'll be able to see kind of a behind the scenes of Amber and I. So our struggles and uh, what we do with our family, what we do with some business stuff that we're doing, and uh, it's not, it's kind of some, there's some raw emotion in some of these things too, so. It'll kinda... explain why he's going gray and I just want to pull my hair out. Thanks for reminding me of going gray. <laughs> Always there for the final compliment of the day, so. All right, so remember, every Thursday at five o'clock Eastern time, we are here to answer what's your flipping question? Any questions about real estate? What's your real... flipping problem? What'd I say? <laughs> what's your flipping question? What's your flipping question? There, what, isn't that right? What's your flipping problem? What's your flipping problem? All right, so I had the wrong title. What's your flipping problem? What's your flipping problem, anyways? All right, so what's your right, what's no, your you. flipping problem? So good. All right, well, guys, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate it. We'll see you all next Thursday at five o'clock Eastern time for what's your flipping problem. We'll answer all your questions, guys. Talk to you soon. Have a good week. See y'all.